My name is Amy Sullivan, and I'm the chair of the AAAR Endowment Committee. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the eighth in our monthly series of ASNT paper lectures. This is a new initiative for AAAR being supported by the Freelander Memorial Fund. With this initiative, we hope to be able to provide an opportunity um, for all of us to come together outside of the conference um, to tie our journal to other activities and also give a platform for um, researchers to present their amazing um, uh, research to our community. So each month, the editors of ASNT select a high impact paper to be presented by its author. And these lectures are being recorded and you can um, access them uh, after off of AAAR's new YouTube channel, which you can access from the AAAR webpage under the events tab. In addition, for each lecture, one of our student chapters is hosting. And so I wanna thank everyone who has helped in making all of these possible and all of you for joining us. And so with that, I'll turn it over to our student chapter from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champlain to get us started, thanks. Thank you, Amy, for introducing us. And hi, everyone. Welcome to the AAAR lecture series hosted by UIUC AAAR student chapter. I am Haoran Yu, the current president of UIUC's chapter, and I feel highly honored to host the lecture series and introduce today's speaker, Dr. Frank Junik. Dr. Junik is a research group leader in the particle chemistry department at Max Planck Institute for Chemistry in Mainz, Germany. He earned his diploma in physics at University of Stuttgart in 1997. And in 2000 years, he got his PhD degree at University of Hohenheim with a study on aerosol mass spectrometry instrument development. His postdoc led him for two years to the Atmospheric Science Research Center at New York State University in Albany, New York in 2001 where he applied his AMS technique on investigating urban and rural aerosols. Since 2000, he has been leading a research group that focuses on the development and application of AMS and other online aerosol instrumentation to explore the sources of urban and anthropogenic aerosols. Now, let's welcome Dr. Junik to give his lecture on the filtration efficiency of homemade face masks with household materials. Thank you, Haron. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to present our research results uh, in this um, audience, to this audience and uh, in this format. Um, today, I would like to present results from our paper, Aerosol Filtration Efficiency of Household Materials for Homemade Face Masks. Influence of material properties, particle size, particle electrical charge, phase velocity, and leaks, which was published in Aerosol Science and Technology about a year ago. I hope that after this lecture, you will have a general idea of how filters work and how well and under which conditions face masks remove undesired particles efficiently uh, from your breathing air. And I hope that with this knowledge, you will have, uh, you will be able to judge news or fake news about such devices, um, just applying this basic knowledge. Let me start with a short recapitulation, um, why we use face masks, uh, what is their purpose? So always we are, emitting um, droplets from respiratory fluids. So when we breathe, the reopening of small airways generates small droplets, which can be emitted uh, by the breathing process. Uh, talking and singing, for example, causes vibrations of vocal cords or the larynx, uh, which also generates droplets in the breath. And of course, coughing, sneezing, or produces uh, liquid sprays from materials, from fluids in the upper respiratory tract. From the breathing to the coughing, the particle size of these particles that are generated in these processes and that are emitted during breathing and uh, singing, talking, coughing, sneezing increases. 
And uh, typically we have smallest particles in the order of a few hundreds of nanometers and the largest ones reach hundreds of micrometers or even the millimeter size range. As soon as these particles are emitted into ambient air, the liquid in the droplets starts evaporating. The droplets shrink down to about 20 to 50 percent of their initial diameter. And uh, during this shrinking process, they already start moving in the ambient air. Very large particles, let's say particles larger than 50 micrometers, really quickly settle to the floor and sometimes even reach the floor before they completely dry it. Smaller particles, smaller than 10 or a little bit more micrometers, stay dispersed in the air and uh, contribute to the ambient aerosol over extended times. And with this, they, of course, can be re-inhaled when we are in this aerosol and breathing this air. When we put a mask in front of our face, the first and most important feature of this mask, of course, is filtration. The mask is supposed to filter out particles from the breathing air, both from the inhaled and exhaled air while it passes through the mask. But in addition to this, a face cover, for example, also prevents us from touching our face, our lips, our nose. And by preventing this, it suppresses potential um, infection or transmission of viruses from the hand to the face or to the respiratory tract. In addition, a mask has an influence on the flow of the exhaled air. Here on the left side, we see two uh, Schlieren photographs. And that's a technique that makes it possible to show um, gases of different temperatures, like we see here in the uh, exhale of this person. In both cases, we see a person that coughs. And here on the left side, we see that this cough extends strongly outward of the, uh, of the mouth. While on the right side, uh, the person wears a respirator and the distance that uh, this cuff extends, the transport distance is strongly reduced. The exhaled air or the cuff air is partially redirected to the top or down or to the side. So this also reduces the distance the particles from our respiratory tract are transported directly with high concentrations. Finally, of course, a mask has a psychological effect. When we see a person with a mask, that always, of course, reminds us of the potential infection risks and thus of maintaining distance. If we think about how a mask and in general how filters work, we have to look at the particle removal mechanisms, the physical mechanisms that cause particles uh, to be removed from an airflow that goes through a mask. Let's assume the mask is a fiber mask. And here, the yellow circles are the cross sections through the individual fibers. And the red trace is the air streamline where the air flows around these individual fibers. If particles have sufficient inertia, which is the case for relatively large particles, these particles cannot completely follow these curved streamlines around the fiber, and they might leave the streamline and end up on the fiber. We assume that all particles that end up on a fiber stay there because they stick to the fiber sufficiently that they are not removed from the fiber again. If the streamline passes the fiber, at a distance less than the radius of the particle. And even if the particle does not leave the streamline, the particle at some point will touch the fiber and again will stick to the fiber, we will be removed from the aerosol flow. Very small particles tend to diffuse. The smaller they are, the more they diffuse. And so they can diffuse away from the streamline that would go around the fiber and eventually might hit the fiber and again be lost from the aerosol. And finally, if the fiber is electrostatically charged and the particle also has a charge, an opposite charge, it might be attracted to the fiber or if the particle can be polarized, it might also be attracted to the fiber, also causing the particle to leave the streamline and be at the end uh, removed by 
um, impaction or by, by hitting the fiber and sticking to the fiber. As I said, all these mechanisms have different size dependence of the particles. So if the particle diameter increases, the, the first two mechanism, interception and inertial impaction, are more effective in removing the particles from the airflow. So we have an increasing particle removal efficiency due to these two factors or due to these two mechanisms. For diffusion and electrostatic deposition, the opposite is true. And with increasing particle size, these mechanisms become less effective. The total filter um, includes all these different removal mechanisms and is the result of, of the sum of all these mechanisms. And as a result, there is a minimum in the filtration or the removal efficiency at a certain size, typically in the order of a few tens to a few hundreds of nanometers. And for smaller particles, as well as for larger particles, the filtration efficiency is better than for this minimum. So it's not the case that this kind of fiber filter has an, um, a minimum size up to, uh, down to which the particles are removed, like a sieve, for example. And below this size, all the particles pass through the filter, but there's a minimum and below and above this minimum, the removal and filtration efficiency increases. About one and a half years ago, our institute was closed and because of the upcoming pandemic. And pretty quickly, uh, it was advo uh, advocated that people wear face masks in the public. Face masks, uh, medical face masks and respirators uh, have not been available at that time. So people started uh, making their own face masks of whatever household material they had uh, to make them or all kinds of companies started selling these face masks and these were typically cloth face masks. So quickly the question came up, can we determine how well these materials uh, filter partic particles of the relevant size range? How well or are they useful to make face masks out of them? Therefore, we decided we need to measure the transmission efficiency of all kinds of different cloth materials for particles of various sizes for the relevant size range. As I mentioned, very small particles are well removed, very large ones as well. So we decided to measure the transmission efficiency and the filtration efficiency for these uh, different samples for a size range from 30 nanometers up to about 10 micrometers. We wanted to have a simple setup so that we can quickly change things in the setup, that we can quickly introduce different kinds of mask materials and that we get reproducible results. We wanted to vary at least some of the measurement conditions, for example, the electrical charge of the particles, but also the phase velocity with which the particles arrive at the mass surfaces. And finally, of course, we needed really quickly a test stand. We need to set up this within a few days. And of course, with the available equipment, we couldn't order anything for that. At the end, we ended up with two different setups, one using condensation particle counters to measure particle concentrations for particles of a certain size. And with this setup, we measured particles from 30 to 500 nanometer diameter. So first, we generated a sodium chloride aerosol with a nebulizer, dried it, and then fed it into a DMA with a, with a neutralizer in front of it. And after the DMA, we get completely charged particles. All the particles are charged that leave the DMA. So we have an additional neutralizer, which we could optionally use to put the particles back into charged equilibrium. The air was then diluted with filtered air from the laboratory and passed through the sample material, through the mask, for example, using a vacuum pump and adjustable valve uh, to set up the flow we wanted to have through the mask. In front of the mask and behind the mask, we had two CPCs operating in parallel 
measuring the concentrations of the particles of the size which we selected with the DMA. In addition, we measured the pressure drop across the sample, and the pressure drop, drop gives us an information about how easily the air flows through the mask and how good the breathability of the mask material is. The relationship between the concentrations before and after the mask gives us an information on the fraction of particles that passes through the mask, the, um, which and the inverse of this is the um, filtration efficiency. The second setup uses ambient aerosol, and we had this aluminum cube. Inside the cube, we um, or from the cube, we again draw air using a vacuum pump with an adjustable valve to draw a certain flow from ambient air through this sample, which was mounted on top of this um, aluminum box. Here we can see the top of the box with the sample installed there. We had two optical particle counters that measured the size distribution in parallel inside the box and of the ambient aerosol all using perpendicular lines in order to avoid transport losses. In addition, we had an SMPS and we switched between the measurement in the box and of ambient air. And again, we got size distributions or size resolved particle number concentrations for the aerosol behind the sample or behind the mask material and in front of the sample. And again, we calcul calculated the size resolved transmission and from the transmission, the size resolved filtration efficiency. We used this setup to first investigate a lot of samples of typical household materials. So we use different cotton textiles, thick and thin ones, woven and a jersey type ones and so on. We use it for all kinds of synthetic fiber textiles and non-woven textiles like fleeces or vacuum cleaner bags, for example. We had some paper materials like paper towels, tissues, coffee filters, and some more exotic materials like polyurethane foam or anti-allergic bed covers, swimsuit, and so on. After we had our first results, we presented our results using a press release to the public. And quickly, we got a lot of requests by companies who started to sell their own masks, their own face masks. And from that, we got a lot of different types of commercially available cloth masks made from cotton, polyester, and non-woven textiles, and a couple of masks which had filter inlays inside it uh, to improve, improve filtration capability. In addition, we measured seven medical masks and a couple of respirators. When using our measurement setup to measure these uh, filtration efficiencies for different types of materials, we typically get results like this, what we see here. It is very similar to what I've shown you before, the filtration efficiency of a filter as the result of the different filtration mechanisms. Here we have the diameter range from 30 nanometers up to 10 micrometers, and a little bit more than 100 nanometers, that's about the size of the coronavirus. Here is approximately the size of the respiratory droplets we are typically emitting. We can see that for very large particles, larger than, let's say, two and a half micrometers, uh, Almost all the particles were removed by all these materials. Some are a little bit less efficient than others, but the removal efficiency, the filtration efficiency for these particles is pretty high for all materials. In an intermediate size range, we see the filtration minimum. And this one shows filtration efficiencies often below, let's say 40%, sometimes even below 20% for the silt sample here, for example. And for even smaller particles, the filtration efficiency increases again. This, of course, is a result of the size dependence of the different filtration or removal mechanisms that cause the removal of the particles from the airflow. In one experiment, we changed the phase velocity by changing the flow rate through the sample. Here we see the filtration efficiency for these four different uh, material samples. 
And we can see that for the 30 nanometer particles, so the smallest particles we investigated, the filtration efficiency decreases as we increase the phase velocity. There's a difference, of course, between the different materials because they filter more or less efficient, but we always see a decrease in filtration efficiency with increasing phase velocity. The reason for this is that the two mechanisms that cause the removal of these small particles, which is the diffusion and the electrostatic deposition, they both have less time to remove the particles from the initial um, trajectory of the air from the initial flow path uh, towards the fibers when the phase velocity is higher and therefore they have less chance to remove the particles from the airflow. The opposite occurs when we look at larger particles. Here we look at two and a half micrometer particles. In this case, with increasing phase velocity, we always see an increase in particle removal efficiency or filtration efficiency. And this is because the inertial impaction which is the main removal mechanisms, mechanism for the larger particles, increases with increasing phase velocity because the inertia increases. In addition, when we look at the pressure drop, we always see an increase in pressure drop as the phase velocity increases. You probably all realized that when you try to breathe harder through a face mask, it's harder to breathe through it. And this is reflected by the increase in the pressure drop. Another example or investigation we performed was looking at how is filtration efficiency affected by the electrical charge of the particles. Here are just two examples, a sweat sample and a cotton sample. And we can see the dashed lines are the filtration efficiencies um, for the particles that are completely charged. These are the particles that come directly from the DMA without additional neutralizer using. And the solid lines are the particles that are only partially charged. They have been passed through this additional neutralizer and brought back into charge equilibrium. We can see that for the whole particle size range measured with this CPC setup, number one, um, we don't see a significant difference between the filtration efficiency measured for the charged or the partially charged particles. For the sweat material, however, for the very small particles here up to about 100 nanometers in diameter, we see a significantly better or higher filtration efficiency for those particles which are completely charged compared to those which are only partially charged. So, as expected, the charge influence is larger for very small particles because this is an effect that is especially important for very small particles. It's not so important for the larger ones. And we see that it doesn't occur for all um, materials. It mainly occurs for synthetic fibers like sweat in this case. And for example, for natural fibers like cotton, we didn't see this influence. So in case you want better filtration efficiency, especially for small particles, it's always advantageous to use fibers that can be electrostatically charged. And this is often the case for synthetic fibers. After measuring all kinds of materials, the whole suit of 44 different samples, we get here, for example, the filtration efficiency, the average filtration efficiency for the larger particles, 0.5 to 10 micrometers. And we can see that for many of the samples, we get filtration efficiency of these particles that are close to 100%. If you look at uh, the, the names of these uh, samples, we can see these are all samples that are made for filtration of particles, like the vacuum cleaner bag, or the surgical mask, the respirator, and so on. At the other end, we see rather, let's say, thin or uh, very porous materials like the poly polyurethane foam, like a thin cotton shirt or cotton material, or also a silk material. They have really low filtration efficiency of 30% or even less. And there's a lot in between. So we have a huge range of filtration efficiencies. In addition to this, when we look at the pressure drop, 
that gives us information on how well we can breathe through these materials, we also see a huge variability in the pressure drops. And the largest ones with 200 uh, Pascal per square centimeter pressure drop divided by the uh, standard pressure drop, which is defined as the pressure drop at eight liters per minute flow rate through a 25 millimeter diameter sample. And um, this is very hard to breathe through. At the other end of the scale, we have a small fraction of this, one and a half orders of magnitude less than that. Again, the polyurethane foam, which has really bad filtration efficiency, but also really low pressure drop. So we could easily put, let's say, two or three layers of this on top of each other and might have a better filtration efficiency. So at the end, we know how well these individual samples filter the material, the particles, but we don't really know which one is the best material to use for such a mask. For that purpose, we measured the filtration efficiency for stacks of samples. So we have here, again, four different types of materials, and we measured filtration efficiency, in this case, filtration efficiency of uh, the larger particles for stacks of all the single layer and stacks of two up to five layers. And here we, we don't see the filtration efficiency, but the particle transmission, because it turns out that the transmission can be calculated for a stack of layers from the transmission of the individual layer by just multiplying the individual transmissions. And then at the end, we can calculate the filtration efficiency from the total transmission. At the same time, we see that the pressure drop linearly increases with the number of layers. So for an arbitrary number of uh, layers, we can calculate the total pressure drop simply as the sum of the pressure drops of the individual layers. With this, we can see that there is a good measure of how good a filter material really works, which is the filter quality factor. This is defined as the logarithm of the inverse transmission divided by the pressure drop through the material. This is a, a value that is independent on the number of layers or the thickness of the filter. It's just an information about the quality of or the filtration quality of the filter material itself. And using this information and the formula in uh, the blue boxes above that, we can calculate the filtration efficiency and the uh, pressure drop of any mask that is composed of multiple layers of material which we have measured. So we do not need to redo the measurements for every combination of layers. Since the filtration efficiency is a rather theoretical or um, not well to handle um, feature and not very easy to, to realize what it means, we try to make this quality factor more intelligible by calculating the filtration efficiency of a stack of household materials for each of our sample, where we stacked so many of the layers that we got a breathability or um, a pressure drop that is the same as our first measurement, which was a surgical mass. So we, we simply calculated how would the filtration efficiency be of such a stack, and all these stacks have the same breathability. And what we see again is that the best filtration efficiencies of these hypothetical masks end up being uh, materials that are made to be filters. But what we also see is that, for example, the polyurethane foam, which was at the very end of, of the list before, is now somewhere in the middle. And we get, at least for the larger particles, pretty good filtration efficiencies above 80%. For the smaller ones, a uh, little bit less. But we need to stack 19 layers until we reach uh, this filtration efficiency and also until we reach the breathability which we had uh, for the surgical mask. That's not really useful. Another example, the French terry, a material we might have at home and we might use to make such a mask. We only need seven layers and we get an extremely good filtration efficiency, similar as the filtration efficiency 
of um, respirators, for example. Finally, the last example, the silk. The silk uh, here, in order to get the resp uh, respirability or breathability of the surgical mask, we have to use less than a single layer because it's hard to breathe through this material. But even then, uh, we get really low filtration efficiency, so it's not very useful. With all this, we can ask, ask which material really makes a good filter. A good filter material is a material that has a high particle filtration efficiency and at the same time, a good breathability or low pressure drop. These are typical materials like those shown here, which consist of very thin and individual fibers with an irregular structure of so-called non warbens uh, which have no holes and no holes from, from the structure, for example. And these are often synthetic fibers with electrostatic charges. Not so good materials, uh, examples are shown here, are spun or coarse fibers, uh, which have regular structure like the woven ones here, for example, which often have small holes in between, or which are irregularly structured also with holes like the paper tissue and typically are made of uh, natural fibers with no electrostatic charge. As I mentioned before, we also measured the filtration efficiency of a number of commercially available ma cloth masks. Here we can see the, again the filtration efficiency versus the particle diameter for different types of mask materials. The black ones and the red ones are both cotton masks, so jersey and woven cotton masks, and the blue ones are polyester masks, and these are those masks that have been available mostly um, at that time when these masks were, were sold. We can see that for the largest particles, we have, uh, let's say, decent filtration efficiency. For the medium-sized particles, filtration efficiency is typically below even 40% or sometimes below 20%. Only for the extremely small particles, filtration efficiency increases a little bit more. Some of the mask materials, which are very thin and very wide meshed, for example, do not even remove these very large particles very efficiently. A different picture is found when we look at here, for example, the respirators, which have almost 100% removal efficiency for the large particles and more than 90 at least for the smaller ones. Or here, for example, these few um, examples we had uh, for cloth masks with a filter inlay, which also remove the particles pretty efficiently. Now I come to something which I think is probably the most important um, thing about these masks. What happens if the mask does not fit tightly? Here we can see again a Schlieren image of a person who coughs and who wears a medical mask. And we can see a fraction of the breath or the ex exhale uh, goes through the mask, but also a fraction leaves the mask to the top, uh, to the bottom, or especially to the side, which cannot be seen here. So we thought about what happens if not all the flow goes through the mask itself. Therefore, we measured the filtration efficiency for a couple of masks. Which where we punched holes into the mask. So we had defined leaks. So we had the complete mask with no holes. This has a relative filtration efficiency depending on the material, uh, which we set to one. And then compared to that, we measured the filtration efficiency for masks with 0.5, 1, and 2% of the area being a leak or a hole. And we can see that already at 2% hole area, relative hole area, we see a decrease in the relative filtration efficiency of about 50%. For a 2% uh, hole area, we also already see about two thirds decrease of the filtration efficiency. And this is for the smaller particles up to two and a half micrometer size. If we look at the very large particles, which the largest one we could measure with our setup, we see that there's also a decrease, however, it's smaller. The reason for the decrease is that a large fraction of the 
air flows through the holes instead of through the mask material. And the smaller particles can easily follow the flow through the holes and are not filtered at all. The larger particles cannot fill, uh, follow the flows that are bent through the holes and therefore a fraction of that impacts onto the part of into the inner surface of the mask and therefore is still filtered. Nevertheless, we see that as soon as the mask is not really tight, small fractional um, leak areas are sufficient uh, that the, the mask um, filtrate, total filtration efficiency is completely deteriorated. Finally, we looked at how long can we use the masks and can they be cleaned? In, com uh, in, in collaboration with a Swiss uh, medical doctor, we measured the filtration efficiency of a filter inlay. And here we see again the filtration efficiency for different samples, the average filtration efficiency for particles up to 500 nanometers in diameter for the new mass. Um, note that the range only goes from 90 to 100%. We see a 98% removal of these particles for the new mass. And this person has used this mass for 200 hours during regular activities over the day. And we see that the filtration efficiency barely changed. Then we heated it to 70 degrees Celsius three times. We got another loss of about 1%. But overall, the filtration efficiency didn't change a lot for this mask with all these treatments. In addition, we did measurements of um, different respirators, for example, where we used new masks. Here, for example, um, an FFP2 mask, which is similar to the KN95 standard here in Europe. Uh, the new one has a filtration efficiency very close to 100%. And it was accidentally put in the laundry machine. And after that treatment, the filtration efficiency strongly decreased. So this is not a good idea to do that. Another example, we had a KN95 mask here, the new one, and this was treated with UV light, disinfectant and strong heating in order to uh, disinfect it again. And again, we see a strong uh, re reduction of the filtration efficiency. In addition to this, we did uh, measurements of filtration efficiency of different cloth materials after sing single and several times of washing in the laundry machine. And we also saw there a slight decrease, in some cases a slight increase even, um, in the filtration efficiency after the washing cycles. However, it was much smaller than these differences here. So overall, we can say that at least this type of mask material can be used for a very long time. And if we carefully clean it with heating, uh, then we can heat it several times without losing a lot of filtration efficiency, while this uh, washing or rougher um, treatment of, of the material reduce the filtration efficiency significantly for these respirators. With that, I try to summarize how effective cloth masks, medical masks, and respirators are, and why are they, they re, uh, effective? So if we look at the cloth masks, we see material filtration efficiency between less than 10% and more than 90%, depending on particle size and strongly on material. The fit is often not so good. Some, like this, uh, for example, has a pretty good fit. So I would say in general, we have a protection of others because the largest respiratory droplets are catched by this kind of mask. However, we typically do not have a self-protection. The materials are typically not useful to remove the smaller particles. Only if they have a filter inlay, then we might also have a self-protection with this kind of mask. If we look at medical masks, their um, testing criteria is that they remove more than 95% of three micrometer bacteria. This is typically easy to um, reach with good filter material because uh, at three micrometers, uh, we are already typically at the upper end 
of uh, the rating and filtration efficiency curve. However, they, from our measurements, typically remove 80 or even more percent of also the smaller particles. So filtration efficiency of the material itself is pretty decent. However, they do not have a good fit. And we have seen that if the mass does not have an almost perfect fit, if it's really tightly fitting to the face, the material can be the best material of the world. It won't remove the particles because we don't breathe through the mask, we breathe through the leaks. So we again have a protection of others because the large particles impact on the masks inside. However, we typically, typically, if they don't have a really, really good fit, do not have a self-protection or a significant self-protection with this kind of mask. Finally, the respirators, there are different um, standards to that. Here in Europe, we have the FFP2, with, which has to remove 94, and FFP3, which has to remove 99% of the particles in a certain size range that includes the filtration minimum. So the filtration is pretty good of the material, and the fit typically is also good, especially when you have masks like this, this cup-shaped masks with a, a rubber seal around the circumference of the mask, which really tightly seals the mask to the face. Typically, we have a good protection of others because the material filters very well. The exception is if the mask has a valve, like on this picture, we breathe out through the valve and that doesn't filter at all. So there's no protection of others in case we use a mask with a, with a valve. However, the self-protection is typically given in all cases for these masks, as long as they fit well, which is not necessarily the case for this kind of mask. With this, I thank you for your attention. And I have to thank my group members who did numberless measurements over the last, last year's summer. I thank our mechanical workshop of our institute for support in machining or setup very quickly and uh, many colleagues who provided sample materials and electron micrographs. And now I'm open for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Junik, for that amazing talk. So let's all give a virtual round of applause for Dr. Junik. And uh, so uh, I'm Joseph e. Pudicheri, a PhD student at UIUC, and I'll be moderating the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please chat, uh, type it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask the speaker your question. Uh, yes, we have one question in the chat box. Um, could you clarify what sweat material is? Um, this is a little bit hard because uh, in, in Germany it's called sweat and it, what you use for sweatshirts um, with synthetic fibers. I'm, I'm not sure if the French terry might be, for example, uh, a good translation. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Hi, Joseph. There is a long question from David Chioketu uh, regarding materials. Medical masks include the KN95 and the simple ones that are one layer of blue paper with accordion folds and ear straps. They are very loose fitting and widespread, often distributed. When an unmasked person enters a mask repair zone, it was not clear if this material was covered in the work and how well is it performed. Was this included? And if so, how did it compare? Um, so, what I call medical mask is this kind of masks, um, which we here in Germany would call um, surgical masks, for example. And they are classified as, as medical masks here. Um, these are masks that according to the criteria of the um, certification, have to remove 95% of bacteria, which have a size of three micrometers. 
These are masks which are initially designed to remove droplets during operations and not for filtering air um, in order to remove aerosol particles. Um, as long this one, for example, is, is a blue mask and there is a layer of blue material, but it's not just blue paper. It consists of several layers and some of them uh, are um, filtering material and some of them are just, uh, let's say, material that keeps the whole thing together. So if if, um, as, as David uh, was talking about, there are really just, let's say, blue paper masks. These masks, if it's really paper or paper-like, like tissue-like material, and then I would, um, I would assume that it behaves, um, uh, it's not here, like the tissue and would not filter uh, particles very well. If it really includes um, the filtering layers like this mask, for example, does, it will filter some material. However, in any case, as soon as uh, the fit to the face is not really good, uh, I would not expect um, that it is very effective in filtering aerosol particles. It's just effective in removing the large droplets from the breath or from when you cough or things like that. That's the explanation. Yeah. Okay, so we have a lot more questions now. So uh, another question is, did you test layering masks? I know for a long time, uh, there were recommendations to layer a cloth mask over a medical mask. I did not test it, but at the end, as I showed, we can calculate what comes out. And if you add the cloth mask to the medical mask, for example, um, the cloth mask typically does not uh, add a lot of filtration capability, but it will have the effect that the medical mask might fit better to the face. So it might close some leaks. So the combination could definitely be better than just using the medical mask where the filtration material might be not so bad, but due to the bad fit to the face, um, it, it might not provide a lot of um, protection. But as soon as, as you add uh, such a shaped uh, cloth mask, which really fits it to the face, I, I could imagine uh, that the overall filtration efficiency is much better simply because you close the leaks. Thank you. So there's another question. Uh, did you look into the influence of relative humidity on filtration efficiency or the measurement uh, was done at RH below some value, so it was considered dry? No, actually we did not. Uh, we, we used dry air and mainly diluted by laboratory air, which is also relatively dry, about 40% relative humidity. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we very quickly put, quickly put together this measurement setup from what we had. And in order to add um, uh, relative humidity control, we, we simply did not have the time. Especially if you think about the conditions you would have um, under real world conditions, where you have relative humidity in the order of 100%, a bit above or a bit below. When, when you exhale. And uh, this is, of course, extremely hard to control in a, in a laboratory setup. What I would expect is um, that you wetten the material and depending on the kind of material, like for example, the cotton material uh, might simply um, increase in size, the threads might increase in size and it's, this might a little bit close some of uh, the holes in the material, but we did not measure this. Thank you. Now, the next question is, could you please comment on how masks affect the concentrations of O2 and CO2 that are inhaled? At the end, it depends on the so-called death volume, the volume within the mask. So between, let's say, uh, mouth and mask or nose and mask, 
that is not uh, replaced during breathing. So if I exhale, I exhale, let's say through the nose into ambient air, and whatever I exhale has increased CO2, and this gas will immediately more or less be diluted in ambient air. If I exhale into this death volume, for example, for exa if I have a mask like this, which has a rigid shape and uh, does not um, touch the face only at the circumference, but not in between, there is a certain death volume which is not um, replaced during each, each breathing cycle. In this case, I would re-inhale a fraction of what I exhaled, and that would increase the CO2. This is not the case uh, for the other kind of mass, which pretty much have almost no death volume, uh, where it's just harder to breathe because I have to breathe through the material, but there's no uh, volume which is not replaced during each breathing cycle. Uh, I can't understand you. Can you unmute yourself? Sorry. Uh, so the next question is, uh, how effective are the different combinations of these masks? Could the effect be cumulated? How effective would be? The different combination of masks, are the effect cumulated? As I said, um, if, you, if you combine layers or masks, there's no difference. The, the transmission would multiply. So if one mask has, let's say, a transmission of 80% and the other one has a transmission of 50%, you would have a transmission of 0.8 times 0.5, which um, is a transmission of 40%. So um, you would have a 60% filtration efficiency. But at the same time, the pressure drop would add. So with this, you, you of course, you have um, a benefit of adding layers in terms of filtration efficiency. At the same time, you have a disadvantage uh, in terms of pressure drop or breathability. So it's harder to breathe through this um, through this additional layer or through this multi-layer mask. Okay. Uh, next question is: Is there any seasonal variation regarding the filtration efficiency? I would not expect a seasonal variation. I would expect a variation uh, mainly occurring due to, for example, the, uh, how humid the, the mask itself is. If, if you have, as I said, if you have a cotton mask and it gets really wet, uh, it might change its, um, the shape of, of its microstructure. Uh, but since, the, the major influence is probably from the exhaled air. I, I would not expect such a large influence uh, due to seasons. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Is there a method to charge a mask to increase the electrostatic attraction to the fibers? Yes, actually there is. And uh, we had measurements where we realized that um, after <laughs> taking the mask out and packing. <laughs> 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 Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'll mute from here. Okay. 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 I, I restart. Um, we had measurements uh, where we used uh, synthetic materials, which um, are easily charged by, um, by, by um, how should I call that, moving them against each other. And um, when we did that, we strongly increased the filtration efficiency. So um, in order to avoid this artificial increase by the movement, we 
waited for a long time until we did the measurements in this case. So if you have material that can get charged, by the, um, then you, of course, you can increase this filtration efficiency strongly. However, I guess as soon as you breathe through it and it gets wet, um, you might lose this effect again after a while. Uh, but it's it's definitely hard to control. So it's better if you use material uh, like that in the respirators, which is permanently charged, where the fibers are permanently charged. Okay. Uh, just a follow-up question on that. Uh, I've seen uh, one paper where they mentioned you can use a blow dryer to, you know, get it charged electrostatically. Is that does that actually work, or do you think that will work? What was used to charge them? A blow dryer. Um, the blow dryer surgical mask to get it charged again. Or... I don't know. I haven't tried, but I could expect that uh, when you recharge a mask, that the charge doesn't stay there forever. Okay. It will be get dis discharged probably after a while. It's okay. Um, there's one more question. Uh, what quality factor Q is standard for medical mask? or respirators or community mass? Um, actually, I can't tell you from the top of my head. Uh, we, we haven't worked a lot with the Q. Um, I, I don't know. As far as I know, at least the standards, the European standards, and I expect the American ones are similar, um, they pretty much um, define the, the minimum filtration efficiency of the material and the minimum filtration efficiency for the respirators of the total mask when it's worn. So that includes the leaks. So they, they talk more about the filtration efficiency or the removal or transmission efficiency um, instead of the filter um, quality factor. Um, Indirectly, of course, they do because they also have maximum uh, pressure drops. So they, they have to have uh, a pressure drop that is below a certain level and at the same time uh, filtration efficiency above a certain level. From all that, one could calculate this, but I haven't done this calculation. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, I'm curious as to where you grab your filter efficiency mechanism graph, as the electrostatic attraction curve in most media is not below that of diffusion and is designed to serve in compensation or enhancement of these of those mechanical filtration mechanisms, natural performance, MPPS dip. That's the last comment in the chat. Um, actually, this uh, this graph is. I, I would not completely agree that it is not below that of uh, diffusion. At the end, that depends on uh, the electrostatic charge of the individual um, fibers. Um, this graph is similar or is redrawn from a graph in the Heinz book. Yeah. And um, as I said, it, it really uh, depends on um, the electrostatic uh, features of each individual fiber, uh, whether one is above or below the other one. Uh, at the end, it, it just shows the size dependence. And that's, I would say, the most important information from that graph. But as I said, it's, it's redrawn from the Heinz book. Uh, aerosol technology. Yeah. Uh, I have one more question, actually. So uh, I know there is a standard testing protocol for the N95 respirators, but to the best of my knowledge, there's no protocol for the non uh, N95 masks. Uh, like, so what are your thoughts on that? Like, what is that? What are the challenges in, you know, proposing a standard protocol so that we can, we can, you know, compare masks across 
different research labs. Right now, people are using different, different protocols, right? Um, yeah, there's a lot of challenges. And um, I think as we have shown with uh, our leak measurements, um, as soon as the mask doesn't fit to the face very well, um, the best mask material is just bypassed. And uh, I would say it's um, pretty simple to measure the filtration efficiency or filtration uh, features of, of a material, but uh, that doesn't make a good mask already. Uh, therefore, I have the impression that um, for, for this medical type of masks, uh, since there are no uh, very, um, how should I call that, uh, the, the criteria for certification do not include, for example, measurements on a, on a mannequin uh, and are much simpler. Um, therefore, it cannot be directly compared to the respirators. And as long as you do not really do a certification as is done for the respirators, I would say uh, the real usefulness for this kind of application for which these masks are not designed initially uh, cannot really be compared really well. Of course, you can, uh, you can define, let's say, um, standard measurement conditions like standard uh, face velocity uh, or standard um, particle size or the particle size ranges. But um, at the end, uh, this will only give you information on, on the filtration efficiency of the material and not on the performance of the whole mask. And I think, and this is hopefully one of the major messages I would like to convey is uh, that the, the fit of the mask uh, might be more important uh, than uh, the filtration features of the mask material, at least as soon as the mass material filters more than, let's say, 80% of the particles. OK, um, I think we are running out of time now. So uh, let's thank the speaker again. And thank you, everyone, for who have participated in the Q&A session.